few minutes with our new Secretary of uh, Ag and Forestry, uh, Basil. Good. So, Basil, welcome to, uh, you're always welcome to come, so if you will, uh, the mic is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you so much for the pleasure to speak with you briefly this morning. I am honored to uh, be here. Uh, I met most of you at the retreat back in September in, in Virginia Beach, and I got to know a little bit more about you and your district. But I uh, just want to speak with you briefly this morning about some of what we're trying to do in agriculture and um, a little bit about our vision. First, a little bit about myself. Um, I am a beef cattle farmer from Buckingham County, Virginia. I grew up on a farm there in Southside where my family raised uh, hogs, chickens, grain, a lot of row crops, uh, but currently my family uh, raises uh, black Angus beef cattle, a small farm. Uh, so if you're ever in Buckingham County, we'd like to have you stop by. Uh, always steaks available for, for everyone. So uh, a little bit, um, uh, and I did uh, go to Virginia Tech uh, once I graduated high school uh, and then went on to graduate school in down in North Carolina. A little bit um, about what we're trying to do. Certainly, Absolutely. I've had the honor and pleasure to work with my predecessors, Secretary Bloxham, um, several years ago, and certainly my immediate predecessor, Todd Haymore. Uh, Todd Haymore and I have worked together since 1988 uh, in various capacities, and I, uh, I tell a lot of people that uh, I. Uh, what the first three or four months that I've actually been uh, working to clean up the mess that Todd Hemore has left there in the Secretariat. So if something's not going well, I blame it on Todd, but something's going great, I take credit for it. But Todd and, I, Todd and I have great working relationships. What I'm trying to do is to work to build on the great things that Todd Hemore has done in the uh, industry of agriculture. Uh, very briefly, uh, a little bit about what we're trying to do is certainly focus on rural uh, the rural economic development. And two things I want to mention to you this morning uh, that we are really excited about and we're really pushing, as many of you know about the AFID program. Certainly that it's a, it's a um, incentivized grant program uh, that focuses on agribusinesses across the Commonwealth of Virginia to help them uh, source Virginia products and to uh, help uh, agribusinesses move to the next level. Another program that I wanted to just briefly uh, tell you about this morning is the Virginia Farm Business Development Program that we recently rolled out in November, where the agribusiness, uh, where the AFID program focuses on agribusinesses, the uh, Farm Business Development Program focuses on those small and um, medium-sized uh, producers across the Commonwealth. This program, as you know, um, is a grant up to $5,000 reimbursable where the producer can focus on things related to the business aspect of their production, whether it's uh, making a stronger web presence or uh, a marketing plan. And something that we're keenly interested in is succession planning. So as you know, a lot of producers uh, in the rural areas are, um, the average age of farmers uh, in Virginia right now is 59 and a half years old. We're looking at the next couple of generations of farmers, so succession planning is a big, big issue in agriculture today. So this grant can be used uh, to uh, do succession planning in our uh, rural areas and in our farm and forestry uh, lands as well. So um, I'll be delighted to tell you more about um, those initiatives or uh, some of our other initiatives that we're focusing on. And finally, I'll leave you with this, that we are uh, looking at how to better incorporate a lot of the technology that's coming out around agriculture today. Today, um, I was um, I was um, delighted to go to a, a demonstration where I saw the use of drones. How drones are being used to actually uh, plant uh, crops and monitor crops on a daily basis, water crops, um, and these unmanned uh, land systems as well. Precision agriculture is, is, is really big, and so we're looking at ways that we can adopt this technology uh, at a larger scale here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I am uh, honored to be here this morning. Uh, again, I am uh, very, very committed to rural economic development, rural Virginia, because that's near and dear to my heart. That's exactly where I'm from, and so anything that I can do to help uh, move forward 
rule uh, Virginia, rule America, and uh, making sure that agriculture is a key uh, cornerstone of economic development. That's what we're all about here in the Secretary of Agriculture. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Any questions, if you will, hit your uh, request to speak button. And so, Dr. Goodwin, uh, thank you so much for being here. Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. You're always welcome. So please come back anytime. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have a great day. Okay. Uh, next uh, on the agenda is we're going to uh, hear someone that is here before this committee all the time. It's David Payman. And David's going to talk to us about groundwater and sustainability. Welcome. Happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's good to be here and good to talk uh, to you about uh, about this issue, which I think is uh, one of the more important issues, one of the most important issues that we have uh, in the Commonwealth, and that's making sure that we sustain our coastal groundwater resources. When I see this map up here, I think I'm back in the third grade, learn how a geology class or geography class. So. But anyway, what we're talking about today is um, the groundwater under the coastal plain. And um, one of the things that has come up in previous conversations is that this is a fairly large aquifer. It, expand, it, it spans a lot of states, all the way down to Georgia and actually slightly into Alabama. Um, now, uh, one of the questions that's come up is, um, so how to, um, does one state affect another state? Um, Theoretically, uh, we do, but um, but it's it's at the margins because, by my calculations, it would take a molecule of water maybe 200,000 years to get from us to Alabama. So it moves pretty slowly. So um, you know we we uh, might have some effect on North Carolina, vice versa, and Maryland at the edges, but not uh, uh, not major. Uh, this is a cross section of the aquifer that. Large Potomac Aquifer at the bottom. There are, are a few aquifers above it. You see the Piney Point and the Aquia. Um, they are separated by clay layers, but by and large, most of what I'll say today is about the uh, Potomac Aquifer. Um, it is uh, deep, uh, uh, thousands of feet down, and um, um, and a lot of water. It does not recharge in the same way that we think of groundwater recharging in the rest of the state. Uh, if it rains a lot um, in the Piedmont part of the state, uh, you, you can see some quick recharge of your groundwater. Um, whatever groundwater you have here is not, uh, recharge you have here is not from um, precipitation patterns, it's from um, a little bit of leakage at the fall line. So it's uh, much more like mining than it is in other parts of the state. Um, so we have three issues with uh, making sure that we don't um, uh, overuse our aquifer. Uh, we've got some declining water levels. Uh, we have saltwater intrusion uh, from pumping that's reversed the flow of uh, water. And we have uh, some uh, subsidence or uh, land sinking uh, that's a result of, of it. Uh, these are um, some, uh, some wells showing that essentially um, we have, in most of the uh, coastal plain, we have been seeing about two to two and a half feet of loss of hydraulic head every year. Um, this is, um, and, and when we finally uh, did a review of this uh, back six, eight years ago, and uh, in general, uh, we, it said that we were probably taking out twice as much water from the aquifer as we sustainably could. In my words, sustainable means we're not losing head. Uh, this is my favorite picture that sort of uh, illustrates uh, the loss of hydraulic head. This uh, is a farmer's artesian well, and in 1927, he was getting water at the top, and then in 32, he had to, he had to drill another hole, and as you see, it went on and on. The hydraulic head continued to drop uh, from other uses of the aquifer. Uh, and, and so that just illustrates um, uh, the loss of um, uh, the loss of head that we have. This shows uh, about where we are right now. Uh, one of the things that we need to um, avoid is uh, drawing water uh, below the aquifer top, and that gray to and I guess that's green uh, uh, barrier border there is uh, you could look at as the 
out for a top. So, so um, close to the fall line, uh, we are pretty close to at the aquifer top, and uh, uh, as you get closer to the beach, we're more like 77%, so we still have some capacity there, um, but we have to be careful. That um, top pre-pumping level line is where we would be um, if there had been uh, no withdrawals from the aquifer. The other thing that we're seeing is saltwater intrusion because of the um, uh, because of the withdrawals, it reverses the flow of groundwater in some areas. Uh, the redder, you see that picture, the higher the chlorine levels, um, they're not seawater levels, but they're, they are chloride levels that are such that uh, um, if you are uh, withdrawing from some of those areas, James City County, for example, has to have a reverse osmosis unit uh, to uh, remove a little bit of the chloride before they can use it for drinking water. Uh, and the third issue is sinking land. Uh, these are some, um, some isoplets uh, of, uh, of projections of how fast the, uh, um, the land is sinking. You don't really need to see the numbers here, but you can just see that uh, um, sort of the focus of land sinking uh, from these numbers is in the Franklin area and in the West Point area. Um, I would say that that, uh, that Suffolk uh, line that you know, it was yellow when it was on a piece of paper, but I'm not sure what color it is now. But Suffolk, um, uh, 3.7 <coughs> millimeters per year, um, that's um, uh, an inch every six or so years, so that's a foot about every 80, 85 years if the line, if that slope were to continue, just to give you an idea of. The, and I think we could say that we have lost about a foot of land surface in the last uh, 100 years. Uh, much of, um, half of that from pumping and half of it from some geologic things. So what are we doing to deal with uh, this issue right now? Uh, we have uh, said all along that we um, aren't on the precipice, but if we wait 10 years, we will be on the precipice uh, of doing things. So we have uh, some permit redu uh, reductions uh, in this part of the state. If you withdraw more than 300,000 gallons per month, you need to get a permit from the from the Commonwealth, and we put that through a computer modeling exercise to make sure that uh, that it is not going to hurt, hurt the aquifer. Uh, and then we are also, uh, we have a groundwater advisory committee um, that you have uh, uh, helped us to set up uh, that is talking up about a lot of policy issues, so I'll quickly tell you where we are with that. Um, the interesting thing is that um, in the uh, uh, in the coastal aquifer for the permitted users, um, 85 to or more percent of the withdrawals come from the top 14 users. So we have focused discussions with those top 14 users to see what we can do um, uh, to reduce their uh, demand on the aquifer. Um, 30 to 35 MGD, maybe as much as 40 MGD, um, is uh, demand on the aquifer that falls in the unregulated category. Um, and uh, so you can see um, most permitted users make up a small percentage, and then I would say that the unpermitted area, uh, we would say is the fastest growing area, um, and our most recent estimate is that that's the, the demand on that aquifer is growing by one MGD per year. Um, so this is the uh, pie chart of the top 14 users. Uh, we did, um, uh, to see what we needed to do to try to, um, uh, to, try to address these uh, uh, lowering water levels, the uh, hydraulic head, um, we did some modeling. And the modeling came out at, um, uh, in, if everybody in the aggregate reduced 57%, uh, the hydrograph would flatten out. Uh, and that sounds like a pretty big number to go 57% uh, right off the bat. Um, the, the important thing, to, uh, an important thing to note there is uh, we modeled them a, as a group, as if they were sort of one facility. Had we modeled each one of them separately, run them through our computer model, uh, the reductions would have been greater. So we tried to look at what's, you know, what, what's the, um, <coughs> the least onerous thing that we can do that will help to get the aquifer back in, in, in a good place. Um, so uh, we've been reviewing um, this situation with the Water Commission all along. Uh, those top 14 users, uh, five of the permits um, 
um, had already been issued and have reductions in them that, uh, that we think meet our goals. Um, five of those permits uh, we, are, we actually have uh, negotiated um, uh, and, and they're in draft permit stage and ready to go. Uh, and then um, the other four, uh, we are conceptually um, in, in a really good place. So I, I want to say that these 14 users um, have really been responsive um, to uh, the challenge that we face. Uh, in a couple of cases, a couple of localities are, um, uh, have decided they're going to spend um, maybe $100 million uh, to, uh, to uh, develop a surface water source. Uh, it's good for the aquifer. It's good for their long-term certainty. Uh, the industries that we deal with have, uh, uh, have stepped up. And so uh, I'm feeling very good um, about uh, <coughs> us having been able to get to a, a good place with those 14 um, permits. We've been looking at things like uh, sw switching to surface water withdrawals, um, uh, uh, maybe getting off the Piney Point aquifer, which is a little bit more stressed, and, and going to a, a less stressed aquifer some of those options, and then uh, there is a proposal that HRSD has for aquifer recharge that uh, could make a big, big difference 20 or 30 years from now, so we're looking at that. So uh, when we've been talking to the permitting, we've been very mindful of the fact that people need time to make changes, um, and, and, uh, and that we uh, are not in the business of uh, shutting down economic development, and we need to be responsive to the needs of uh, each of the individual facilities as well. Um, and then, you know, we've looked at other options that, that I mentioned before. Um, and I'm just very, very uh, encouraged <coughs> with those discussions, and, and we believe that uh, we are going to um, move forward with, uh, with agreements and permits with, uh, with those 14 users that, uh, that are going to take us where we need to be over the next 10 years. Um, and then there's the advisory committee, which um, I am saying is, is separate from the, from the permitting. It's more the long term, what do we need to do uh, to have even more resilience because those reductions uh, get us to level, but we also we want to be in a position where um, water is available for economic development uh, and for um, uh, human consumption as well. Um, so uh, we have put together that committee that uh, it's been a, um, a high-level decision-maker committee that has been then staffed by um, uh, work groups, uh, five work groups that uh, uh, that bring advice to that uh, committee. Those work groups have met 20 times. They are looking at things like uh, uh, what are the options for alternate sources, what alternate management strategies might we use, how can um, regions uh, be uh, maybe more interdependent than they are right now so that we have more resilience in our use of the water. Uh, what about trading, uh, which is an aquifer, uh, how can aquifer recharge help us? Um, looking at alternate permitting criteria and some funding options. That report is due to you uh, this coming fall. Um, I think we're on uh, a path to do that. and. I characterize that um, that whole effort as a forward-looking effort, the permitting as a what do we need to do right now to stem the tide, and um, and then the forward-looking effort, what do we need to do uh, in the future to be uh, where we want to be. Uh, I think that's what I just said. Uh, now, you just one last thing. Um, you know, what about other states? Um, other states have uh, in the on the eastern uh, seaboard uh, have been facing the same things. Um, in general, uh, these states have uh, either had partial or complete moratoria <coughs> on uh, further withdrawals from the Potomac Aquifer. Uh, North Carolina, in particular, about 10 years ago, said everybody's got to get, get off 30 to 75 percent. That's sort of about where we are right now. Um, and, and they said no new withdrawals from the Potomac Aquifer. They're beginning to see some rebound, and they may not have to stay at the no, with, no withdrawals uh, state. Uh, but uh, uh, but that remains to be seen. That's uh, that's where we want to be. And I would say, uh, through our permitting efforts right now, we probably are. Going to, we think we're finding ourselves in a similar place to where maybe North Carolina uh, has been as well. And we hope to see the same rebound that they've seen. And with that, I'll be happy. I think that's my last slide. I'll be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, uh, sir. And I think uh, the. Uh,
chair of the Water Commission, the delegate uh, Wright is first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, delegate Taylor, I mean, uh, Director Taylor, let me just say that uh, I appreciate the, the work that uh, has been done, uh, the cooperation and working together with the State Water Commission. We realize what a, a important issue this is, or it is a finite commodity, uh, but I feel comfortable that uh, efforts are being made working with uh, the users, uh, the different partners, uh, to find a solution. It's not a short-term solution available. It's something that's going to take a, a, a long period of time. And I'm glad to see that there are uh, many different options being looked at and that, that all the people who are interested and will have them be affected and have an effect upon the situation seem to, to have the interest of solving the problem at all. So uh, that does... Uh, Bode well, I think, and I want to congratulate you all on the job you've done and look forward to working with you. Well, thank you, Delegate Wright. I completely agree. Um, I, as I said at the outset, this is a very critical issue, and I'm uh, very heartened by um, the support that you've given us, as well as uh, uh, the conversations that we've had with the users of the aquifer, recognizing that uh, we need to do something. Next is Delegate Knight. Yes, sir, Director Taylor. You know, I sit on the State Water Commission, <coughs> Chairman Wright, and uh, one thing I saw in here may be, I don't know if it's a little mistake or not, but uh, we're talking about aquifer use, deep water well injection aquifer use, you know, with Yorktown Aquifer. You know, I see we have a uh, well, Chesapeake Northwest River we're talking about a user, and that takes surface water for that particular plant there at Chesapeake. I mean, it's a pretty big user there, but that is surface water. That's not aquifer water there. On that, I see you got Western Branch. That may be deep water, but okay. Uh, they, they they actually have both surface and groundwater, and there's an aquifer <coughs> and recovery system there. I saw it at Western Branch here, and I know that's a long ways away from Northwest River. And the other thing that you and we know about is uh, Chesapeake. For one, their water treatment plant there on 460, they have deep water well injection, and uh, of course, Hampton Road Sanitation District is looking to maybe get $2 billion for the federal government and from some rate users to do deep water injection. I know that from some testimony you have showed us at State Water Commission is when the land settles and if you quit using that water in that area or if you pump the water back in, it brings it back up again. So, you know, if the, the only way we recharge now is from the fall line of the mountains, you told us, but also we may have another option later on with deep water well injection, and that's uh, something I think is very exciting. Uh, Elliot, uh, Knight, I, I absolutely agree. I think that uh, um, especially the HRSD proposal, because it's uh, maybe that proposal has the potential to um, uh, re-inject 100 million gallons per day um, into the aquifer, um, and uh, it looks like it can work as it stands right now. That can deal with land subsidence. That can address... Um, salt water intrusion, and it can also address, uh, address um, availability of water. Uh, coincidentally, um, you know, 100 MGD is uh, not too far from what's actually coming out of the aquifer today. But, as I said, groundwater moves slowly, so, you know, it's 25, 30 years before we begin to really see um, a significant benefit, but got to start, start now. Doug Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many of you said several times how critical this uh, situation is. You know that the Joint Legislative Law Review Commission took a look at this issue as well. And I was going to suggest to members and see if you agree that if they are interested in more knowledge about this and hope public face, a look at the JLR report. It has some really vital information that supplements certainly what you've given us today. Absolutely. <coughs> It was a great report. Um, they spent a lot of time going into it. A lot of good data. It goes into a whole lot more detail than what I did today. Uh, next, uh, Delegate Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Taylor, you had talked about some of the localities and some of the top, some of the, the, the top permitted folks using top water sources. What are examples of those? Uh, James City County. Um, is um, uh, is proposing to build a, um, a surface water plant, um, uh, and I'm not what what I prefer. What, what I don't know what water they use, and it's not out of James, is it? Uh, we have at, the, at the 
mouth of the Jane of Chickahominy. They'll have to do a little bit of uh, desalination, but uh, that's their proposal. And then Western Tidewater is looking at a surface water, building a surface water plant um, as well uh, to make sure that they have uh, the additional capacity that they need to grow. All right, Dr. Porter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dave, I, I think this is more of a comment than a question, but as we've developed Smith Mountain Lake and, and found the need to provide sewer, uh, which uh, does have to end up discharging into the waters of the lake, or the immediate tributaries there too, we ran into a, uh, a real uh, public perception problem of uh, sewage going into into the lake. And I, I think I'm just suggesting watch out for the public perception on the deep water injection because I, I think there's going to be a many people probably are informed that really not very comfortable with that. Uh, yeah, Delta Point Actor, that's uh, exactly right. Um, I will say I have uh, uh, drunk some of the water already, and I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're doing better than the raw milk people out in Mississippi. But, uh, but I would, uh, let me also say uh, it's not unprecedented. Uh, Phoenix does it. Uh, they do it in Florida. Uh, they do it in California. Um, I think need is going to um, also have to um, uh, inform public perception. Uh, Mr. I, I agree with you, but I think there's probably going to be an education component to that. Exactly right. Thank you, sir. Exactly right. All right. Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to add on to comments from, from Director Paler uh, with regard to the perception. As he mentioned, a couple of projects that are outside of Virginia. We actually got one in, in Virginia, up in northern Virginia, where we have the Upper Occoquan Sewage Authority that discharges at the northern end of the Occoquan Reservoir and Fairfax Water Authority that takes it out at the bottom end. And so, it, in fact, uh, if we had simply hooked them right up, it would be cleaner water and it would be less expensive, but you got that perception issue that somehow you need to put it in the reservoir and then take it back out. But it's technology that's been used in, in Virginia for a long time, um, but you do have to be cognizant of the public perception, but I think that's overcoming it. Delegate Wilson, uh, on this subject, yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, um, on the JLR report that was mentioned, is there more detail about the uh, the point of feed, I'm sorry for lack of a better term, that where the aquifer is fed from? You mentioned that briefly earlier in your presentation. Is there more detail in that? You gave the, the little picture of 1932. Uh, more detail. How far back has this been tracked? Um, yeah. That's kind of broad. As, as, how far back has? I, I, I'm. Let me sure I understand. Are you asking where it recharges? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, the answer is uh, we don't know every place that it recharges, um, but that it is along the fall line and it is through tracks, <coughs> cracks, and fissures that uh, that create a conduit down to the. Potomac, but I'm not sure that that's uh, very well quantified. Is there more that we can say about that, Scott? This is Scott Cuddles. He's uh, the smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, it, it actually does recharge from a number of different areas. Now, the um, uh, amounts of recharge are estimates. Um, we don't have um, a lot of exact measurement of where that recharge occurs. Some of the recharge occurs, as David indicated, um, along uh, cracks in the bedrock at the fall line. Um, some of it occurs um, where the aquifers, what we call daylight, where they um, make it to the land surface, and so they're a conduit there. Those things also occur along the fall line. And then the final place is <coughs> rainfall that occurs over the entire coastal plain. Um, the uh, amounts from all three sources are very small. Uh, most of the water that's taken out of the system is uh, 40,000 years old or older. So um, that kind of gives you a perspective. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I don't want to belabor it, but maybe we could have a, a conversation on that. The big, my question is, we're looking at these uh, modern day solutions and so forth, but my question is, are we looking at anything going back to, to where the, the whole process begins? And do it, have, is the amount of uh, recharge, is that the same now as it was? 50 years ago, 100 years ago, anyway, at Talon. What's changed? What, where where the, do we know, have we identified anything? The, the only, we, is, we have no reason to think that it's re 
charging more slowly. Uh, there's nothing to suggest that that would be uh, that that's an issue. But when I have asked Scott to uh, quantify recharge, he's put it in the tenths of an inch per year for our category. So what's changed is um, uh, is the withdrawals, and the withdrawals probably started uh, 1940, 50, and they've been growing ever since then. And not just Virginia, the whole eastern seaboard. Uh, we've always assumed that there's plenty of water and. And we just tap in, and uh, we're at a point now where we have to manage it more, uh, more actively. Doug Ransom. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, thank you, Director Taylor, for everything that you do on this issue. Um, you mentioned that you are uh, having great communication with some of the largest users, um, and you felt comfortable with that. And I know that there'll be a lot of major investment in infrastructure. But is there a timeline moving forward? Is there a, a goal date for when the, that infrastructure should be in place? It's uh, in the 10 to 12 year range. And when I talked about uh, uh, timing being an issue and we weren't necessarily on the precipice right now, uh, we have, uh, our, our uh, philosophy has been um, to get there uh, as fast as we can, but in a reasonable time frame. So. We're looking at um, with essentially within the next permit term, or maybe slightly beyond, which which is a ten-year permit term. All right, tell me where. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to shift to a, a different uh, focus of the DEQ, and that is the uh, study ongoing on the James River. And I just was wondering what the current status of that undertaking is. Uh, thank you, Delegate Ware. That's the status on uh, what the chlorophyll number should be. Exactly. Um, I got briefed just a couple weeks ago. Um, there is, um, I think, um, a growing consensus on the science. One of the other things that's being looked at is um, I, I, what the um, implementation uh, strategy, strategies should be. And uh, just to make it simple, I'll say, should it be an instantaneous concentration number or should it be um, uh, a three-year average, or how do, you, how do you do that? So we're in that phase of discussion right now. Um, I have to say that uh, at my the briefing that I had, it was, um, again, sort of surprisingly encouraging that uh, we might um, be at a point where all sides are agreeing on the science, and I'm hopeful that, uh, that we're going to get a similar kind of consensus on... Uh, what the methodology should be. Um, it is, um, because of that, um, uh, it's a little slower. We're not, uh, we, we may not quite meet our targets. I have uh, been um, following on the principle it's, uh, it's better to get it right than to get it soon. So um, that's where we are. Um, I'm hopeful on that, uh, but there's still some details to be worked through. I appreciate it. Jim, I appreciate that very much because I do have, I hear particularly from one of my localities about that uh, and, the, and the potential effect it has on them yes. on a regular basis. And I'm delighted because I think sound science is the, is the basis for any good policy. And I appreciate the, the work that you all are undertaking in that score. Okay. All right. Seeing no other questions, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, you're always welcome to come back. Thank you. So next uh, in the vendor's box is uh, Delegate uh, Cox. So uh, you have uh, House Bill 2311. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Always good to be back in front of ACNR. Always Mr. Chairman, I'm going to sort of explain the bill. I do have two amendments, but I think maybe it'd be better if I sort of walk through the bill first and then get to the amendments. Um, this bill is a result of a study conducted pursuant to Executive Order 52, which directed a whole bunch of people, and I can name all the stakeholders, but I won't do that, to basically get together uh, dealing with the Virginia Nutrient Exchanges uh, Program. And basically what it does is uh, it recommended methods to facilitate the acquisition of nutrient allocations or credits to the Virginia Nutrient Exchange Program to offset discharges of nutrients. Uh, point source dischargers in the Chesapeake Bay watershed on a long-term 20-year basis. If you remember last year, I came with a bill from Tramlin Corporation, which was a really environmentally friendly uh, paper company, which
which have also had a liquid fertilizer and did some very innovative things with waste crops, et cetera. And one of the dilemmas was obviously if you're going to try to make that capital investment, a lot of the way our nutrient credit program worked, it was hard to get a long-term commitment, it's hard to get the credits. The exchange can be a little bit cumbersome. So it really sort of came out of that. So let me sort of tell you what it does. Um, uh, the bill promotes the position that if public funds are used to acquire nutrient credits, they should be evaluated on the cost effectiveness, reliability of the technology used, durability and permanence of the credits, among other factors in order to make the best use of any appropriate taxpayer dollars. This bill would allow such analysis by the Department of Environmental Quality. So then you have some metrics to go by as far as those evaluations would be made. Also, if you remember that uh, the old legislation established a sub-fund uh, and it gave preference to animal waste to energy facilities uh, should the fund be capitalized. No facilities of that type have come along. It's probably not a good idea to favor one source over another anyway, so it removes that language. And finally, the bill also allows, and this is going to be a moment, allows for the Secretary of Commerce and Trade to advise the Director of the Department of Environmental Quality on disbursement of credits from the fund for value economic government prospects should such credits become available. So obviously we need to balance the environments and the caps with new projects like Tramlin. And so this would give the ability the Secretary of Commerce and Trade to sort of weigh in on some new exciting maybe possibilities we have in economic development. So having said that, Mr. Chairman, I do have two amendments. One's technical. And the first one is on page one, line 25, after allocations, strike for and insert from, and that just makes the language better. And the second amendment, Mr. Chairman, is on page one, line 41, after the strike Virginia Economic Development Partnership and insert Secretary of Commerce and Trade consistent with. We felt like probably at this point in time with all the things the EDP has going on, it might be better have the Secretary of Commerce and Trade uh, do that function. And so those are the two amendments, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, we'll have a motion on two. Okay. All right. Any discussion on the amendments? Take them in a block. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, I have the Deputy Secretary Russ Baxter of uh, Natural Resources if you'd like to make any comments. If I left anything out, Russ. Morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Russ Baxter, Deputy Secretary of Natural Resources. First of all, I'd just like to thank Delegate Cox for carrying this bill on behalf of the administration. And I had nothing further to say from his presentation unless there were any questions. Thank you. Do see any questions of the committee? If you will, hit your uh, button. But, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this the first time that we're going to put a cost to a pound of nitrogen? Is, is that standard practice or is that? No, that's a, that's a free market decision. Uh, what, this fund has not been capitalized. It is authorized in the code, delegate. Um, and uh, it has not had any funds appropriated to it. What this would do is set up a process by which DEQ would evaluate proposals of those sellers that wish to sell credits to the Commonwealth, should there be funds available. And then they would do that, um, you know, present a proposal just like you do an RFP uh, for building a building or doing anything else like that. There's no no price is set. Um, it's it, that would be determined. Okay. Any further questions? Thank you. All right. Anyone in the audience want to speak in favor? You want to speak in opposition? What's your pleasure? Oh, sorry. Good morning, not opposition. Uh, this is Peggy Sander, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I uh, just wanted to uh, both thank Delegate Cox for putting this bill, uh, this bill in, thank the administration, and especially Russ Baxter for his support of the bill. We support the bill. We think it furthers the goal of the Commonwealth in ensuring that we maintain water quality standards while allowing for economic development. Thank you. Thank you. Good report. I have a motion and a second to report. Any further discussion? All, right, all those that uh, wish to vote, uh, please do so.
somebody show Tony how to flirt. All right, so is, is Key Mr. Lee? He's walking in. He's walking in. All right, come on. We'll wait for you. Mr. Chairman, do I have the honor of being the first electronic vote in this committee? You do. You uh, it sort of looked like it. I didn't know. <laughs> Looks like the uh, bill reports uh, 20 to 0, and so thank you. All right, uh, next is my seatmate, uh, Delia Austin. Tell us about what you want to do, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm bringing before you today a bill by request by Bottetown County. It's the uh, James River Scenic River designation, House Bill 1454. There is an amendment to the bill. Uh, I'll basically read the bill, and uh, I think we're at, I've asked to pass out a piece of literature also that defines uh, an article by Travel and Leisure magazine of how the river has been used for tourism and recreation and the designation it got this year. Uh, the bill is, is pretty self-explanatory. The amendment to the bill is uh, no dam or other structure that impedes the natural flow of the James River in Bonnetot County shall be constructed operated or maintained within the section of the James River designated as a scenic river by this statute. Where would that go, sir? Pardon? Uh, where would that uh, limit uh, reference? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a subsection C amendment. Uh, I believe this is the one we're looking for. It reads, nothing in this section shall be construed to prevent or restrict the United States Army Corps of Engineers from operating or modifying the operation of the Gathright Dam in accordance with its designated uses. That's correct. That's it. All right, let's get that before us. All right, any, uh, have a motion on that? Have a motion, a second to on that to any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, basically, House Bill 54 declared, 1454 declares the James River in Bonnetot County from the origin of the James River to the Bonnetot Rockbridge County line as a scenic river, James River Scenic River designation. Currently, approximately 14 miles starting at the western most area is designated as the Virginia Scenic River. This would allow the remaining portion starting at, at Springwood and totaling 31 miles as a scenic river designation. Uh, the river has earned quite the reputation as a destination. People from surrounding states often travel to Bottetot County and spend the weekend tubing, kayaking, and fishing the James River. A small business, Twin River Outfitters, has seen their business flourish. This has reflected in the local economy as restaurants, motels, bed and breakfasts are doing well. The river was just recently recognized by Travel and Leisure Magazine as one of its 15 most designations destinations worldwide for adventure and travel analysis. We want to preserve the scenic beauty of the James River and feel this bill would enhance that opportunity. Local government, Montauk County Board of Supervisors, held a public hearing and no one spoke in opposition to the designation. I truly feel this is I truly feel this is good for both the local economy and the scenic beauty of the James River. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other all right, do we have any questions to the picture? We do, uh, Delegate Orr. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I may, and this is actually on the amendment. Uh, I don't have any hard burn with the underlying concept because historically the scenic river designation does not have any impact on otherwise existing riparian rights of all property owners. My concern is with this amendment. Yes, sir. We are implying, I think, by its addition that somehow we've changed something because if you don't have this amendment, it doesn't impede current dam and water authority from continuing. We have never, to my knowledge, on any scenic river designation put any kind of an amendment language of this sort because we have always held it doesn't change any and all other existing rights. And, and my concern is the law of unintended consequences. When we put something on there, the courts feel it means something. So obviously we had to put it on this one so why didn't we put something on every other scenic river designation? And if the gentleman understands my concern, uh, and, and with that, unless he can explain it why, I'm going to move to reconsider the vote whereby we adopted the amendment. But you got a good explanation well, why 
what this doesn't mess it up for every other scenic river designation we've done in the Commonwealth here before. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Matt Wells of West Rock, we asked the delegate to put the amendment on the bill to uh, ensure that we did not inadvertently complicate the operation of the dam, which our uh, bill at Covington uh, relies upon. Um, certainly aren't trying to do any harm to the bill. Um, I would note that there are other uh, scenic river designations that do have Similar language, uh, and my understanding is to avoid misconstruing what the scenic river designation is supposed to do. That's all we're trying to do with this. Okay. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any problem with the underlying bill. Um, and, and I appreciate the gentleman's explanation, but that being said, I would still move that we reconsider the motion whereby we adopted the amendment to House Bill 1454. All right, so we have a motion and a second to reconsider the amendment that we just approved. So, uh, any other discussion about that? All those in favor of the amendment to uh, strip the uh, amendment uh, off, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, well, everybody knows. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, yeah. uh, Who wants to leave it? Okay. So you lost your amendment. Okay. I think we will let the bill go ahead. The, the, the dam is on the Jackson River, which is controlled into the James River. The dam is basically for flood control. Uh, and, and I will go ahead. I'll defer to Clyde. Mr. Chairman, real quick, thank you. Clyde Christman, I'm the director of the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And, uh, Buttertop County Board of Supervisors passed a resolution last year asking us to evaluate this section of the river. We did. It's very pristine, very, very beautiful. Um, I encourage you to go visit it and spend money in Delgate Austin's district with his outfitters. Um, and Delgate Ork, I agree with your assessment. And what I just suggested for the gentleman is that we can write a letter just to clarify to them that this designation would in no way impact the guards right there that they currently operate. I think that'll take care of his concern because Delgate Ork is absolutely correct in his analysis. And so we support the bill as it is before. Yeah, before you leave, let me ask you, uh, explain to us, because uh, we have this every year, one of these bills come forward. What does the designation do, and what does it not do again? Well, first of all, as De Delegate Orrock said, it absolutely doesn't impact any riparian rights whatsoever in any way. The main reason that these designations have become so popular with the localities, as Delegate Austin mentioned, is that it provides another tool in the toolbox for, ec for economic development related to tourism to get people to come because when somebody from the, out in the West is coming and not familiar with it all and they see that this is designated as a scenic river by the General Assembly, then they know that this meets the higher level of standards that we do when we do an evaluation of the river to assess the scenic beauty uh, and, uh, and that is a very, very objective evaluation. People know they're coming to a treasure destination Again, it really is a, a, a good, important tool for local tourism efforts. All right, so if I own land uh, on Scenic River and I want to put a dock <coughs> or a pier uh, on that river, then um, if, it's, if it's designated beforehand or afterhand, does it make any difference as far as do I have to come see you? No, sir. You would just have to go through the process with VMRC and the Corps of Engineers, and we're not even a part of that process. All right, so. Anything that is done on the river, do I have to go to, to your I, I believe the only thing is that, is that if a new dam was to be built, they'd have to come to you in the General Assembly to get your authorization for a new dam on that section. But I believe that is the only, that is the only restriction in the code. All right, so is that just uh, a new dam? Is that just for a scenic river or is that for any river? Well, uh, the process for a new dam for any river is, is going to be very, very complicated. Uh, the only distinction I'm aware of with the Scenic River Program is that they would actually have to come to the General Assembly to get your approval to build a dam on a section of the river that you have designated as a scenic uh, river. But that is the only restriction otherwise. So what you said earlier is the Scenic River designation is basically about marketing uh, to, uh, to attract uh, tourists uh, to, uh, yes, sir. to this park. Do right, you have any questions of... Uh, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any questions of the patron? Before we, uh, all right, 
anybody will speak in favor of this bill? Anyone speak in opposition? Welcome, sir. Hi, I'm Steve Carter Lovejoy. I'm the um, chair of water issues for the uh, Virginia Sierra Club, and we'd like to support this, this bill. Oh, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so we have a motion to report. A second. Uh, any other discussion? All right, uh, here seeing none, all those in favor of uh, this fine bill. Please be for it. Let's get a second. So please vote. All right, is everybody voted? No. Uh, no, there we go. Okay. All right, uh, let's close the roll, and it looks like it reports a 19 to 3. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Joe. All right, so uh, going down the list, uh, House Bill 1691, at the request of the uh, speaker, uh, he has asked for that bill to be sent to the uh, ninth floor for appropriation, so I need a motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Let's go down the list. Uh, HB uh, 1781. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, may I present some, some Excuse me. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I feel a disadvantage in presenting this bill because Marty Farber is not here to bail me out. Anyway, I, I want to say to you that this is a cleanup bill as it relates to the Department of Agriculture. It's cut into the request. It essentially takes out some uh, redundant and unnecessary reporting that they've been engaged in. And you know we have these bills <clears throat> in each session that uh, kind of takes out some language in the code that we no longer uh, is pertinent. In the first section of the bill, it deals with the uh, farmer's markets, but not your local farmer's market. It deals only with those instances of reporting on farmer's markets that are owned by the state. There are only a couple of those left now, and uh, that reporting uh, seems to serve no good purpose and this bill would eliminate that. In the second instance, the section that is repealed relates to uh, what has been essentially a uh, combination of reports related to conversion of farm and forest land. Those reports will continue to be uh, developed by the uh, individual department, but no longer will there be a request that the Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer uh, Report Services summarize the reports. So that, in essence, is what it is. They got a couple of redundant reports. All right, so we have any questions of favor? Anyone in the audience will speak in favor? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Kevin Schmidt, uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, thank you, Delegate Plum, for this bill, and the administration does support this bill. Okay. I'd be glad to answer any questions tomorrow. See you, John. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Dr. Weber? Who, who's your question for? Uh, I guess the patron, just real quick, the second report that you mentioned, who does that go to? The uh, report was com compiled by the Department of Agriculture, but I'm not sure where it went. The, the, this is the uh, farmer's market report that you were, or the farm and forest land report? The, far, the farm and forest land report. Uh, farm and forest land goes to the uh, House uh, and Senate Ag Committees. And, it's on, and it comes from the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry. Okay. All right. Anyone in opposition? All right. What's your pleasure? We report second. Have a motion and a second to report uh, House Bill 1781. All wishing to vote, please do so. All right, so uh, let's go over just a couple of things. Looks like that's all the bills. That, uh, you know, first of all, we're going to meet at uh, 9 a.m. for now. So uh, you know, they'll show up at 8.30. There's a big black audience also. So uh, the other thing that's going to change a little bit this year is a subcommittee uh, that uh, have approved a substitute will be uh, posted uh, online, so you'll be able to see those before you get to, uh, to the committee so that uh, you don't come in and somebody plops down, you know, 20 pages and you have to read it in 30 seconds. So, uh, 
so that would be posted online. I want to make sure that everyone got the notice from the Ethics Council uh, on the Virginia Beach retreat saying that uh, there was nothing to report because I wanted to make sure we all are doing the same thing. <laughs> so we all either rise or either all go down together. I just didn't want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we have a sale big enough for all of us down there. But, uh, so, uh, so I want to make sure that we do not have to report uh, anything. Uh, so uh, everyone got that? Anybody report anything? <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, so uh, next week, uh, Doug and Wilt, if you will, talk to us a little bit about who is coming uh, for us next week. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next week we'll have with us Glenn Rhodes. He's a farmer from Rockingham County, and he is on the cutting edge of food production. Uh, actually raised a crop this year, and uh, he's going to be here to present to us, as well as uh, representation from Virginia Tech and, and James Madison University, the two bodies that are helping orchestrate the, the testing and, and developing the program going forward. All right, also we're going to have someone from Virginia Tech who's going to be here to talk to us about him uh, also. And uh, I don't know why, but the uh, one of the groups who wants to uh, legalize marijuana wants us to uh, take all the restrictions off of him. And as the paper said, it's rope, not dope. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so all the subcommittees, we have about 50 uh, bills before us, so we've got a lot to do uh, in just a short period of time. So anything else, please come before the committee. Or we'll all rise. Thank you.